Good afternoon. Uh, joining me today are Health Secretary Dennis Schrader, uh, Deputy Secretary for Public Health Services, Dr. Jinlene Chan, and Dr. Ted Delbridge, uh, the Executive Director of the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems. Uh, thanks to the millions of Marylanders who have rolled up their sleeves over the past nine months, Maryland is one of the most vaccinated states in America. We have now administered more than 7.9 million COVID-19 vaccines. 96.1% of all Marylanders 65 and older have been vaccinated. 83.6% of Maryland adults 18 and older have been vaccinated. And we have vaccinated 82.6% of all eligible Marylanders age 12 and older. We've achieved these numbers uh, with strong public health outreach, innovative lottery and scholarship promotions, a relentless focus on equity, and without resorting to blanket mandates. As a result of all of our efforts, Maryland continues to withstand the Delta variant surge better than just about any other state in America. Last week, we reported the lowest COVID-19 case rate in the nation. Our positivity rate has declined by 20% over the past month. Our hospitalizations are down 60% from their peak, and we remain well below all of our pandemic surge capacity triggers. While hospitals in other parts of the country are overflowing with COVID patients, in Maryland, COVID hospitalizations are down and account for only 11% of our total hospitalizations statewide. We continue to avoid uh, the surges that other state states are experiencing by constantly adapting and evolving our public health response. From day one of this crisis, our focus has been on preventing hospitalizations and deaths. Our uh, initial strategy was one of containment, which evolved into mitigation and then to vaccination. And we have now moved into a phase of maintaining immunity. Uh, we are working to get uh, more of those last uh, remaining 16.4% vaccinated, uh, while also beginning the administration of booster shots for additional protection. There has been um, limited, uh, confusing, and contradictory guidance from the federal government. In spite of that, Maryland health officials and our state team have spent the last several months building the infrastructure for a statewide operation for boosters. Last month, uh, the moment that we received FDA and CDC authorization, we immediately began administering boosters to immunocompromised Marylanders. In addition, we launched an antibody, antibody testing program for nursing home residents across the state in order to ascertain their current levels of immunity from COVID-19. This pilot program, which was the first of its kind in the country, found that more than 60% of the nursing home residents tested demonstrated some form of waning or weakened immunity and showed that as many as one in three were particularly vulnerable. As a result, we issued an order which made all Marylanders 65 and older who are living in congregate care settings immediately eligible for booster shots. Last week, immediately after receiving final CDC approval, Maryland became one of the first states in the nation to authorize boosters for seniors and high-risk individuals. As of today, uh, the state of Maryland has already administered over 78,000 booster shots. We have mobilized a robust network of vaccination providers, including pharmacies, primary care providers, mobile clinics, community health centers and local health departments. And we have both the supply and the capacity to provide a booster shot to anyone who needs one. If you're confused about boosters, uh, you're not alone. Uh, with so much conflicting uh, guidance out there, I wanted to take a moment today to simply give Marylanders uh, the current status. To determine your eligibility for a COVID-19 booster shot, the simplest thing to do is look at your vaccination card. If you received your second dose of the Pfizer vaccine at least six months ago, meaning uh, March 30th or earlier, uh, you may qualify for one of the categories which are currently approved, which are everyone 65 and older, 
everyone 18 and older with underlying health conditions, and everyone 18 and older whose occupation puts them at increased risk, including first responders, healthcare workers, and public transit and grocery store workers. If you're in one of these categories, uh, you should strongly consider getting a COVID-19 booster shot immediately. If, like me, uh, your vaccination card says that you received a Moderna COVID-19 vaccine and you are immunocompromised, uh, you're, you are also eligible for a booster shot. However, there's still no uh, approval or guidance yet on Moderna boosters for the wider population, although the White House this week advised us that this is expected shortly. If you are one of the more than 280,000 Marylanders who received the single dose of Johnson & Johnson vaccine, there is still no federal guidance whatsoever uh, for boosters. I know this is uh, incredibly frustrating, and we uh, uh, repeatedly pressed for and we can, are continuing to press for more action. We're hopeful that we will see more progress in the next few weeks. In Maryland, we've already launched a vigorous outreach effort uh, for those Marylanders who are currently eligible for a booster shot. Last week, the Maryland Department of Health issued a bulletin directing vaccine providers to immediately make booster shots available to all eligible Marylanders. State health officials are engaging directly uh, with Maryland nursing and congregate care facilities and with local health departments, primary care physicians, hospitals, pharmacies, and other providers across the state. And this week, our statewide call center began directly and proactively contacting all eligible Marylanders um, and have already scheduled more than 30,000 additional appointments for booster shots. You can visit covidvax.maryland.gov to find out where Pfizer boosters are available near you. Uh, we will also be launching a series of television and radio ads uh, encouraging eligible Marylanders uh, to get their booster shot. The other area where we are awaiting action from the federal government is the approval of vaccines for 5 to 11 year olds. Uh, earlier this week, Pfizer submitted data to the FDA uh, showing that its vaccine is safe and effective for children. We anticipate that approval of this will come by the end of October. With that in mind, I have directed state health officials to advance and accelerate their operation plans uh, for vaccinating children, working closely with pediatricians, school systems, and local health departments. The very encouraging news is that since the start of the school year, we have seen no surge in statewide COVID metrics. The cases that have occurred in schools represent a very small fraction of cases statewide, and we do not see any kind of increased severity among children. There are currently only 11 COVID pediatric hospitalizations statewide, uh, which represents just 1.3% of our total COVID hospitalizations and as I mentioned, uh, COVID patients make up just 11% of our overall hospitalizations. The most important thing that school systems can do right now is to uh, limit outbreaks and to prevent needless uh, quarantines is to utilize the robust testing capacity that they've been given. Last year, Maryland introduced a statewide testing program for schools where we immediately made um, a, a million tests available uh, for both public and non-public schools. For the current school year, uh, we provided $182 million to local school systems specifically for surveillance testing of the student population. And we have now extended the application period for this program to October 10th. So far, only 13 of the 24 public school systems are participating. Uh, today, we are again urging every school system to take advantage of this program. The Maryland Department of Health's testing program also has an additional 415,800 rapid tests available right now for schools to access. In addition, uh, we have provided over $2.7 billion in emergency federal COVID uh, stimulus funding directly to school systems over the past 18 months in order to keep kids safe. However, nearly $2 billion of this funding still remains unutilized. There's no excuse for any school system to fail to take any steps toward keeping their students and teachers safe. Uh, in addition to kids uh, being back in school, uh, the beginning of fall also brings the start of flu season. 
And this year, we're actively monitoring the flu in addition to all of our COVID metrics. Hospitals are facing issues of staffing shortages, and we are taking proactive steps to maximize the ability of our hospitals to increase their nursing workforce. Last week, the Maryland Department of Health issued a notice allowing registered nurses or licensed practical nurses uh, who hold a current active license in any other state or jurisdiction to render nursing care in the state of Maryland. State health officials are also strongly encouraging hospital systems to utilize nursing students, nursing assistants, and physician assistants as force multipliers. Our Secretary of Higher Education has again issued a request to the leaders of all of the state nursing uh, programs to once again allow the earliest graduation possible for qualified nursing students. Today we are announcing that we will uh, introduce emergency legislation to uh, make some of these reforms permanent so that our hospital systems have the tools they need to respond to future crises. Lastly, uh, while nothing is more effective at saving lives than the vaccines, a very effective clinical treatment, monoclonal antibody therapy, uh, the state of Maryland has an abundant supply of this treatment and state health officials strongly recommend the use of monoclonal antibodies for COVID positive individuals. Uh, it's uh, one of the first things you should do, you should consider doing uh, before having to go to the hospital when by then it may already be too late. Uh, these treatments are available at more than 80 facilities statewide and uh, accessing them is as simple as talking to your healthcare provider. More information is available right now uh, on monoclonal antibodies at covidlink.maryland.gov. We've uh, already administered more than 13,000 of these antibody treatments, which have helped us avoid approximately 600 hospitalizations and more than 250 deaths. Uh, many more can be prevented if more patients take advantage of these life-saving therapeutics, which is why state health officials have directed clinicians to take actions to step up their utilization of monoclonal antibodies and to make sure that every patient who is qualified for this treatment is offered it. Uh, we continue to have one of the strongest health and economic recoveries in the nation, uh, and we continue to work hard every day to save every life we possibly can and to keep us Maryland strong. Uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Secretary Dennis Schrader to give us some more details on our ongoing uh, efforts uh, to boost and reach uh, eligible recipients for boosters. Thank you, Governor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've been prepare, preparing to provide Marylanders with COVID-19 booster shots uh, and I'm welcomed the news from CDC last Friday. Uh, we've also been calling on the federal government to recommend booster shots for some time and fully support this critical step to further keep Marylanders safe. Uh, throughout this pandemic, we've been clear and concise and want Marylanders to know exactly who is now eligible for a Pfizer COVID-19 booster and where they can get one. There are four categories of people who are eligible. Uh, Marylanders who are 65 or older, uh, Marylanders who are 18 years of age or older living in long-term care settings, Marylanders who are 18 to 64 at high risk of COVID-19 due to underlying medical conditions, and Marylanders who are 18 to 64 years old working in settings that increase their risk for exposure to COVID-19. The only other eligibility requirement is that six months needs to have passed since you completed a full two-dose Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine system series. In other words, you are eligible six months after your second Pfizer shot. Uh, at the moment, there are approximately 500,000 Marylanders who are now eligible for a Pfizer booster shot. We currently have an ample supply of more than 1 million Pfizer doses across the state. Eligible Marylanders can get a Pfizer booster shot at one of hundreds of locations in our robust network across the state, including pharmacies, local health departments, primary care physicians, 
hospitals, mobile vaccination clinics, and elsewhere. We've updated our covidlink.maryland.gov so that you can search where a Pfizer vaccine is available near you and make an appointment, if necessary, with a provider. All COVID-19 vaccine providers in the state have received uh, the Department of Health's bulletin that provides them with clear guidance, including that anyone who asks for a booster shot simply needs to self-attest that they are eligible and that no provider should turn anyone away. As the governor mentioned, the MD GOVAX call center will reach out to all Marylanders who are now eligible. On Tuesday, we began calling Marylanders, and yesterday we started sending texts in both English and Spanish. If called, you'll be greeted with a message explaining that you are eligible for a booster and are then given an option to speak to an agent to schedule an appointment or defer. If we reach someone's voicemail, uh, we leave a message explaining their booster eligibility, and we provide information to call us back. The, test, the text asks for you to please call us at 1-855-MD-GOVAX, our call center, or visit covidlink.maryland.gov to schedule your booster appointment today. The MD GOVAX call center outreach also includes options to submit a request for an in-home vaccination through our No Arm Left Behind campaign. It includes ride share assistance and my MI uh, my uh, IR support to troubleshoot access to immunization records. Regarding my IR, starting next week, Marylanders will be able to access a QR code that has their COVID-19 vaccination in it through myirmobile.com, and that will hopefully continue to make it easier to gain access and to uh, 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 demonstrate uh, that you've had a vaccine, vaccination. All of this is one component of our robust communications plan to proactively encourage those who are now eligible for a booster shot to get one. In addition, we're going to run t television and radio advertisements. We've begun posting information on social media, including our GoVax Maryland Twitter feed. Uh, where you can find facts and other information that you can trust about COVID-19 vaccines and more proactive communications about booster shots. There is no need to wait to hear from us, however. If you are eligible for a booster shot, we strongly encourage you to get one right away. As I mentioned, anyone who is now eligible for a booster shot or isn't certain can also call our call center at 1-855-MD-GOVAX with any questions. Before I conclude, I want to say a few words about testing and monoclonal antibody treatment. Getting tested for COVID-19 is still extremely important and easy. All one has to do is go to covidtest.maryland.gov to find one of nearly 1,500 locations across the state to get tested. Yesterday, more than 33,000 Marylands were tested. We encourage anyone who has COVID-like symptoms to get tested right away. Depending on where you get tested and which test you get, you could receive your results immediately through a rapid test or receive your laboratory results within 48 hours from most labs. If you test positive, monoclonal antibody treatment is a critical and life-saving tool that is available at no cost to providers or patients across the state. We are encouraging Marylanders who test positive for COVID-19 or have been exposed to someone with COVID to ask their physician about monoclonal antibodies or go to one of the more, 70, more than 70 facilities across Maryland that are administering the treatment. Simultaneously, we have renewed our call to physicians to strongly encourage offering monoclonal antibody treatment to patients upon request to prescribe them accordingly. We have a form that we have sent to all providers to complete if a patient could benefit from monoclonal antibody treatment. This form could be sent to the infusion site with the closest proximity to the patient. Providers can also find this form at coronavirus.maryland.gov under resources. To date, as we heard, more than 13,000 doses have been administered in the state and we have sufficient supply of monoclonal antibodies on hand today. Finally, if you are now eligible for a booster shot, please get one. 
If you are unvaccinated, please get vaccinated. I'll stop there, and I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Ted Delbridge, for uh, additional remarks. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Governor Hogan, Secretary Schrader. Thank you for your continuing leadership. Since March 2020, we have been closely monitoring our health care system to ensure it continues to meet the exceptional challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, several interventions over the course of this marathon have been directed toward optimizing the ability of the health care system to respond. Further, health care system metrics have served as an important barometer for how Maryland is doing overall. As of today, there are 7,290 patients in Maryland hospitals. Among them are 797 adults and 11 children with COVID-19. Overall, 10% of patients in acute care hospital beds have COVID-19, as do 22% of patients in intensive care units. In fact, one out of every four COVID-19 patients in a hospital is in an intensive care unit. Some metrics are reassuring. The number of COVID-19 patients in Maryland hospitals has remained stable over the past three weeks. We hope that signals a peak in the current COVID-19 surge. We are particularly focused on the number of children requiring hospitalization. While any child in a hospital is a concern, the daily hospital census for children with COVID-19 has also remained stable. However, we must not stand down. There are several important distinctions between what we have already experienced and what's to come. Rural hospitals are being disproportionately affected by coronavirus. The hospitals with the highest numbers of COVID-19 patients serve the Eastern Shore and parts of the Western state, where a lower proportion of residents have sought vac vaccination. And undoubtedly, that's no coincidence. Across the state, hospital emergency departments are busy. They signal the emergency medical services system when they're particularly challenged by declaring a yellow alert. As of this morning, 25% of Maryland's hospital emergency departments were on that status. They are not busy, busy exclusively because of coronavirus, but more so because of the sorts of illnesses and injuries they treat all the time. Marylanders unquestionably are back on the go. Finally, last year we were concerned about the potential convergence of a COVID-19 surge in flu season. Fortunately, that did not come to fruition. All the mitigation factors toward coronavirus were effective at reducing the incidence of flu and other respiratory illnesses. Flu season was uncharacteristically mild, resulting in fewer emergency department visits. Now, People on the move seem less likely to be wearing masks, and we are already seeing more people with an assortment of respiratory illnesses seek medical care. Without question, the people of Maryland are fortunate to have a health care system that has repeatedly proven its resilience. This is a testament to the tens of thousands of people who go to work every day in our hospitals, clinics and offices, and in the field. However, those same people are just plain tired of going at more than 100% for so long. Hospital staffing is a challenge, leading to less flexibility to accommodate new surges in patients. Thus, we continue to treat COVID-19 patients at the facilities at Laurel Medical Center and the Washington Adventist Hospital in Tacoma Park. We continue to operate the Critical Care Coordination Center, or C4, helping to match the needs of patients with available resources throughout the state. This week, we will expand the C4 to include pediatric patients and their needs. As I noted, COVID-19 is a small factor contributing to children in hospitals. However, other respiratory illnesses and viruses are affecting children earlier this year than is typical, leading to more emergency department visits and hospitalizations. Each of us should be asking, what can I do? First and foremost, if you have not been vaccinated for COVID-19, please do so. This problem will not go away without you. Also, more than one third of the people who get COVID-19 end up with long-term health effects. I know that many people still have questions or may have gotten bad information. Please get the answers from reliable resources. Vaccines are exceptionally safe and effective. I wouldn't have gotten one myself or made sure that my family did as well if I didn't believe that to be the case. As Governor Hogan and Secretary Schrader said, if you develop COVID-19, promptly speak to your healthcare provider about treatment with monoclonal antibodies. There is a limited window of opportunity to receive that treatment once you are tested positive, so time is of the essence. Please get a flu vaccine. Flu season starts this week. We must all do what we can to limit the spread of influenza. Otherwise, we create the potential to overwhelm our healthcare system, creating needless suffering and even death. The vaccine is the best tool, and now is the time. And it's available from your healthcare provider and pharmacies all over the state. Pay, pay attention to what actions that keep you and those around you healthy. 
The rules haven't changed. Wash your hands often. Stay away from others if you are feeling ill. If you are not yet vaccinated, or if you can't be assured that the people around you are, play it safe. Wear a mask. Unfortunately, the challenge has not yet ended, but we know what will carry us to the finish line. Hopefully, we can all do our part, and the healthcare system is doing its part. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. With that, we'll be happy to take some questions. Right. Governor, I just want to talk about mandates, um, first responders, that sort of thing, people potentially having to work their jobs, counties, all the Once again, how do you feel about that? So, Well, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, we're leading the nation in vaccination. And uh, so far, I mean, there are only 16.4 percent of the people remaining who have not been vaccinated, which is far better than, you know, most places you would go in the country. So we don't think that there's a need for uh, mandates. Uh, we, we've been doing very, very well with the plan that we've had for a long time, which is just continually giving people the facts and encouraging them as strongly as we possibly can. Uh, uh, as we were coming into the room today, uh, news came across that the U.S. Senate passed a continuing resolution that appears it is on track to avoid a shutdown. Of <coughs> as you know, the infrastructure bill right now appears to be a bit sidetracked. Um, given the fact that we are 17 months into this pandemic right now, what is your viewpoint from in this state house about how what has been going on in Washington is it affecting the stability of the country to respond to this crisis? Well, uh, you know, I'm probably like a lot of people in America, completely uh, frustrated with uh, <coughs> divisiveness and dysfunction in Washington and the fact that uh, they don't ever seem to get anything done. Um, and, you know, and maybe both parties are to blame, but, uh, you know, this was the infrastructure bill, which I've been working on for more than two years and been an integral part of bringing people together, that we passed it overwhelmingly in the Senate. Uh, we got the president on board with it, and this was, he was touting as his signature achievement uh, about come, bringing people together and getting something done on a bipartisan basis. Republicans and Democrats have been saying they're going to do this for decades. We finally are on the goal line, and uh, the House is playing games and now trying to force other things into the discussion. The extra three and a half trillion dollars that there's no by uh, you know, the, the, it's frustrating. The leadership in the House is about ready to blow up both of these deals. Uh, you may end up with, with no, nothing, uh, which would be a real shame. And quite frankly, uh, you know, it's not just a failure of leadership in the House. It's uh, if the president uh, really wanted to get this done, he would tell the leaders of the House to pass his bipartisan infrastructure bill and stop playing games with all these other things. So yeah, very frustrated with Washington. Have been for a long time, but probably never more so than today. Well, we're, we're going to take action against anybody who uh, fails to provide a booster shot to somebody who's eligible. No question about that. But yes, it's very frustrating. It's not just my frustration. We, all 50 governors are on the call with the White House every week, and every one of them is expressing tremendous frustration that the, uh, they'll say one thing one day and the complete opposite the next day, that, that they give you know, conflicting information from the White House and the CDC and the FDA that is constantly changing. Um, and, you know, we understand it's, there's a lot going on, uh, but they've got to be more clear in their messaging. The reason I had the press conference today, although we didn't announce a whole lot of actions, is mostly just to provide some clear guidance because people are confused out there. Um, but we again reiterated today that, uh, that providers uh, need to provide the boosters to anyone who's eligible. They can go on the website. We're contacting every single person who is eligible is getting multiple phone calls uh, and text messages. And we'll make sure that they get that 
uh, booster vaccine, and if we find someone who's not providing them, then we're, we'll try to address it from the health department. But uh, we, had, we were on a Zoom call with all of our team today, and Dr. Robert Redfield, who's one of our advisors, said he's already been called four times by the Maryland Department of Health, the, the automatic thing, our system that's calling out because he's eligible for a booster and hadn't got it yet. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it was a mistake, and I think that's one of the things we're asking them to clarify. Also, you know, they keep uh, telling us that we're going to get more definitive answers and we'll, a broadening of the categories, and hopefully within two weeks, perhaps uh, Moderna, and perhaps uh, within four weeks we get the approval on uh, children that are younger. Uh, but I, I just can't speak for why, you know. The, the, Well, it's, I, I can only go by what they put out, and it's unclear. <laughs> so we're, it, we're trying to be as aggressive as possible. If someone uh, feels they're in one of those categories, we're going to try to get them a booster shot. Governor, you mentioned pending legislation for the session regarding the public use staff shortages based on the orders that have already been issued. What are you interested in seeing continue, and, and why are you seeing great seed Well, so under, uh, under a state of emergency, um, I had the power to change all of those laws, and the state health department has the power to put in orders. Uh, but they're short-term in nature, and uh, they're only for that current emergency. And some of these we found would be really helpful going forward, and we, of course, need the legislature's concurrence. And so we'll likely be submitting that emergency legislation on the first day of session, or if there's a special session before that, we'll probably do it the first day of that. So in regards to the uh, news yesterday about the Comptroller saving up $2.5 billion dollars in funding a surplus, essentially. Uh, what should the state do with that money? Uh, should we pump the brakes on spending it? Should we spend it from the bank? What, what do you think? Well, I think we'll be uh, making some determinations about that um, shortly, but uh, we don't want to spend it all. Look, I, when I, I ran for governor, there was a $5.1 uh, trillion dollar de uh, deficit. Uh, we now are at zero, and we have a surplus. We don't need to go back into the hole like we were uh, before. We've worked very hard to try to get to this point. Uh, we also worked really hard on this federal funding, which helped us get to this point. We have one of the best economic recoveries, 16 months of job growth. All the numbers are doing better than expected, and that's great. Uh, but we're going to continue to be fiscally responsible, and uh, we're not going to just try to find new ways to, to waste that money. We're going to kind of try to keep as much of it on hand as we can or figure out a way to give some of it back to the taxpayers. And we're getting about 82% of the population now vaccinated. For Marylanders out there who are thinking, when are we going to reach herd immunity? When, when is it? You know, the numbers have stabilized much. Is that well, we, you know, we're all learning uh, as this thing evolves. No one's been, we're in uncharted territory, right? It's uh, what we're finding now, what the federal government's just discovering and what we've been finding is that while these vaccines were a tremendous success, Operation Warp Speed, they've been tremendously effective at, uh, at preventing serious illness, hospitalizations, and death, that they do have uh, a, only a certain shelf life. And uh, so well, I mentioned earlier, we're about maintaining immunity because we're finding people after four, five, six months, it starts to drop off. And we've started vaccinating people nine months ago. So, um, you know, it, 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 we, it's not just how many people do we get vaccinated the first time, it's how many people can we keep safe for a long period of time until we stamp this thing out. Question about school testing. Uh, you had reported that 13 of the 24 school districts I spoke with Frederick Collins last week, and they were insistent that they are going to continue to work with their own county health office. That is something that I know is not being recommended. What ability do you have to bring these other districts into the state? Well, it's an optional program. Uh, we just want to make sure they're doing robust testing, and if, uh, lo if a local health department has the capacity and is doing a good job, you know, we don't we don't necessarily want to. Uh, upset the apple cart, but we had some of our local leaders saying they didn't have the ability to do testing, and we've had unlimited amounts of testing and money available, and we keep repeatedly telling them that. So uh, if people are not comfortable with where they are on testing, then they should uh, get more involved and help. Uh, but if they have a good program at the county, it's perfectly acceptable. We just want to make sure that the kids are safe and that we're, we're checking to see if anybody's getting infected. Can you please explain your thinking about how that applies to public schools? 
What do you mean? Like, why, why don't you want to do a vaccination mandate um, for public school students? Well, right now, students can't get vaccinations, and we've done 82% of all the ones who are eligible, but a lot of the kids are not approved by the federal government. Um, we, we also, I just mentioned that because we've done so many that we, we haven't found the need for it, but we couldn't mandate, even if we wanted to, that kids get vaccinated when they're not allowed to get vaccinated. Hey, Governor, you mentioned the expansion of um, the My Iowa program. Um, does this essentially create a voluntary um, vaccine passport that employers and other entities could use to determine whether or not a person is vaccinated and, and uh, do not potentially deny people entry? No, I think it's just uh, another way for people to have the convenience of being able to, you know, to show that they have it. But I, we're not looking at any kind of vaccine passport. Or Last question. Thank you, Teresa. I want to come off topic questions about SNAP funding. Did, um, did you or your administration submit a waiver request, a waiver request for the USDA in the Dish Act for the Dish Act Uh, you know, the program has ended at the federal level. That's a question better directed to the president or the congressional delegation um, rather than us. We didn't make the decision. Uh, but we did add more state money to the SNAP program. I know early on, not sure how many states did that, but we provided additional funding over and above what the federal program did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.